The cross hatching is one of the everytime favorite target looks when trying to stylize 3D rendering. Sadly, it is very far from being easy to reproduce, as it is often the case with 2D artistic techniques where the artist takes lots of licenses to be able to convey a precise feeling. It's just that 3D engines are built for objective representation of reality, they fall very short on the emotional side, let's say. The idea for this approach to cross hatching came to me from the implementation of one of the stylized light I did in my Spider-Verse style emulation video. These lines are always oriented towards the sun, while keeping their shape relative to the screen, and they change intensity with the amount of light that reaches the underlying geometry. If you imagine them being ink lines, you can very well understand why I consider this a pretty solid base to start from. By the way, if you don't want to be bothered with following the tutorial, you can download a sample project containing this post-process straight away by following the link in the description. So, first of all, let's try to understand what we're trying to replicate. The cross-hatching is a technique used to add shading to a drawing through a series of parallel and evenly spaced lines that can vary in weight and density depending on how dark the area should be. The cross component of the hatching comes when, to add even more shade, we start adding multiple layers of lines on top of each other, each with a different direction. But to have a good cross hatching isn't enough to do that. Usually the lines are oriented accordingly to the direction the light comes from. Even better, the lines should also take into account the shape of the surface, to convey even better the volumes. Well, this last thing will be a complete disaster to try to replicate, so for now we'll pretend we didn't know it and stick to the previous example. I have an idea in mind for that though, but will probably be material for a follow-up video. So, everything will be procedural, get your brain ready. Our starting point will be the screen UVs, but not as they are, we need to do a few adjustments first. If left as they are, our lines will be very unstable, changing thickness inconsistently with the changing resolution of the screen. Let's calculate the aspect ratio of our viewport by dividing width by height, and multiply the UV R channel by this number. With this operation, our UVs will stay squared and won't deform anymore when the viewport changes shape. Also, let's move the UV origin to the center of the screen by subtracting 0.5 at the beginning. As last thing, let's mirror the G channel to avoid some problems later. I can't visualize it now, but basically if we didn't do this, our line space wouldn't be aligned to the view space, making them rotate in the opposite direction of the camera. Cool, now the second ingredient, the light vector. Let's grab the scene directional light vector. We don't want it as it is though, we want to project it on the screen, so it is described in the same space as our UVs, in two dimensions. Let's transform it from worst space to view space, remove the third component and normalize it. And that's it really, now you can imagine this vector equal to the arrow I wrote on paper before. Now we're ready to create our hatching. By projecting our UV vectors on the light direction, we obtain a gradient oriented along it. Now, we can multiply it by the number of lines we want to draw and just keep the fractional part of the result. For clarity, I'll put on screen the same thing we're seeing here in viewport as a plotted function in Desmos. You can imagine this as the cross section of what's displayed in the viewport, seen from the side and with brightness interpreted as height. Let's now remap the gradient range from 0 to 1 to minus 1 to 1 and remove the sign to transform it into a triangular wave. This can be considered by all means as the line's distance field. Next step is to decide how thick our lines will be by remapping this triangular wave. What we want to do is to stretch this wave vertically so that every area below 0 will be considered as ink, while everything above 1 will be considered as clean paper, while leaving some transition grey values that will serve as anti-aliasing. Let's subtract from this gradient the desired thickness for our lines and divide it by the transition length. Lastly, let's clamp the final values between 0 and 1. Now we need to show these lines only where needed. Let's grab the rendered scene and let's calculate its luminance. 
Now let's threshold it to create an ink amount mask. Where we see black, the ink, we'll have our lines. Where we see white, we'll keep the paper clean. To use this mask to effectively make the lines white where we don't want them, we need to multiply together the inverse of the two images and then flip again the result. As final touch, let's also add a base opacity value for the lines as the pen ink is never perfectly black. To add the cross element to our hatching, now we need to calculate multiple layers of these lines and combine them together. To not lose our mental sanity, let's move everything inside a material function with some parameters exposed. Only that for every layer we should be able to change the direction of the lines. That can be easily done by rotating the light vector by an angle. By setting up a rotator node like this, you'll have a full turn nicely represented in a 0-1 branch. What we got so far is not bad, but it's still a bit too artificial to my eyes. No human would be able to draw such perfectly straight, evenly spaced and parallel lines from side to side of a paper. The beauty of the handcraft relies in the perfections, so let's add some. Often, when drawing with the cross-hatching technique, we cover just small patches at any time. This sort of reset of the hand causes a slight offset in the position, angle and density of each group of lines. If we try to draw the outlines of each of these patches, we discover their shape is pretty close to a Voronoi. Alright, we know what to do then. For this video, I'll use UE's standard Voronoi implementation. If you want to understand what Voronoi is and how it works, I have a video that walks you through how it is implemented from scratch. And if you actually want to get a better result than mine with this cross-hatching post-process, you can take it a step further and implement a more advanced Voronoi. So, let's start again from R squared UVs and let's scale them by the number of cells we want on the screen. UE's Voronoi is 3D, but we only need it for two dimensions. So, let's append a third coordinate to the UVs and use it as a random seed. This node outputs the position of each cell. We can use it as input for another vector noise node set on cell noise to have a random color for each cell. Cool, the idea will be to use one channel of this random color as a random rotation on the light vector to slightly offset the lines in each Voronoi patch. Let's move this code to our material function, grab the first channel and save it to a named root node. Now we need to add a new rotator to our light vector and use our Voronoi data as time. Our random value goes from 0 to 1. Let's subtract from it 0.5 so that the lines will have a chance to rotate both clockwise and counterclockwise. Now we multiply this result by the maximum amount of rotation we want and connect the result to the rotator. It sells the idea, but I still not quite like it. The shape of our cells is a bit too squared. They should be elongated along the direction of the lines to result more natural. If we wanted to stretch the Voronoi along the base axis, that would be straightforward. We just scale one of the two UV components. But how do you stretch the UVs along an arbitrary direction? There's a trick. First, let's calculate a vector orthogonal to it by switzling its components. Now look at this. If we take the dot product of the UVs and the light vector, we obtain a gradient that is oriented along the light direction. We already knew that. It's the same thing we did to generate our cross-hatching lines. Let's do the same with the light tangent. Now we have a second gradient that is rotated 90 degrees from the previous one. If we append them together, we realize that we effectively rotated the UVs along the light direction. Which means that now we can simply scale the components individually, like in the example earlier, to have the deformation happen along the light direction. And now we can rotate back these transformed UVs to realign them to the screen, by multiplying each component by the corresponding light vector and adding the results together. Let's now plug in these new coordinates into the Voronoi. Success! Even though I don't like that the cells are getting smaller, that will make the effect more difficult to tune up. 
We can preserve the area of each cell by simultaneously dividing the other coordinate by the same deformation value. That works, let's update our material function. What else? Since at the change of the size of our paper we don't change the scale of the lines we draw, we could try to emulate something similar. If we calculate the ratio between our current viewport resolution and the reference one, like the 1080p of the Full HD for example, we obtain a number that can automatically increase or decrease the number of lines that are drawn. Moreover, we can add another layer of imperfection to our cross-hatching by randomly varying a bit the density of the lines in each Voronoi cell. There's nothing left now but using what we build to obtain a pleasing result. Four levels of lines will be enough, orthogonal to each other in pairs and the two darkest layer rotated by 45 degrees. We can include some ambient occlusion to the lighter layers just to give a bit more depth to the final result. Let's add a paper texture and let's use it to slightly vary the thickness of the lines across the screen. Let's apply it as a barely visible background too, to increase the feeling of looking at a paper surface. Let's give these shadows a bit more depth. Let's grab the word normal buffer and dot product it with the light direction. Once again, let's use the paper texture to give some variance to this gradient. Let's keep only the part of the gradient that's in the shadow and adjust a bit its curve and opacity before multiplying it on our cross-hatching. I'd say our cross-hatching is complete, but why not add the outlines we did in my previous video as a final touch? Let's also give it some transparency at voila! You can download this outline post process from my Gumroad too, there's a link in the description. It won't be included in the sample project of this cross-hatching shader, but who gets it will receive a little discount. And speaking about discounts, as usual there will be an additional one for all my patrons, thanks for your support guys. Let me know what you think about this result, probably I'll follow this up with the curved hatching I was mentioning at the beginning, if I manage to figure it out. See you there!